Hey, White Sox fans, guess what? Southside Sox on the farm, podcast number 28. Yes, this is the podcast. If you are interested in the White Sox minor leagues, and frankly, you might want to have that checked out if you are, <laughs> this is the place to be. So welcome, friends, fans, men, women, pets, writers and rival sites, Baseball America, Chicago White Sox front office. Hello, Rick Hahn. <laughs> hey, speaking of Rick Hahn, guess what? I am so lucky to have my guest, as always, my co-host with me here. We refer to him now as the Rick Hahn Whisperer. No doubt about it. It's probably not a compliment, but no doubt about it. Not minutes after we published last week, Darren Black's expose in, in detailed analysis. It was, it was ugly, ugly results. He didn't want to have to write it, but he had to write it regarding the DFA of Dallas Keuchel and the future DFA of Josh Harrison, just basically what to do. What, what do you do white Sox? And the first suggestion, the big suggestion was getting rid of Dallas Keuchel mere minutes after the general manager of our team, Rick Hahn read that. He said, you know what, Darren, you're right. You're putting the right pressure on. You've made an excellent argument and I am going to release Dallas Keuchel and make Jerry Reinsdorf eat about $14 million in salary. Thank you. Hero, hero, fan, fellow friend, fellow writer at Southside Sox, Darren Black, you are a hero. Thank you for joining me on podcast number 28. Yeah, I'm sure it was a really tough decision to DFA a Dallas Keuchel. Well, sure it was really beaten down on them. Darren, all I can it, say is it didn't so happen. so many other options. It did not happen until you published your piece. And I'm sorry. Thank God I didn't somehow sit on that or forget to publish it because it would have been pretty much useless five, 10, 15 minutes or hours later. But listen, you know, credit due. You did the thing. You know, I mean, that's 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 the White Sox. We're not talking about the White Sox here on the farm. You know, baseball America's right now, like, hey, come on, what get to the get to the get to the farm system, you idiots. But uh anyway, um <laughs> You wield power, <laughs> so oh, use it yeah. wisely, but use it aggressively because you're one for one. Thank you for doing uh, the duty that you did because now we do not have to watch Dallas Keuchel pitch for the Chicago White Sox ever, ever, <laughs> ever again. Um, but, you know, Darren, we're going to run through, uh, again, I lied to all you faithful listeners and readers a couple weeks ago when I said we'd be back in a week. Well, it turns out we weren't. Boy, I've been lying every single episode. I don't think we've gone back to back yet. So, of course, hopefully next week, I won't be lying and we will oh, yeah. be talking again. <laughs> but, but, but Darren, I want to ask right off before we get into a couple of weeks worth of MVPs in the system, a question that relates to that. And that is, how big a drag of it is to be, I mean, you've been doing this with Southside Sox now. This is the fifth season uh, and I appreciate you for, uh, for it. <laughs> it's been hard work. Uh, it's not, it's not terribly fun. I mean, as fun as it can be to write a recap about a loss, because, you know, you can sort of dig in in a different way. In some ways it's fun to cover, you know, it can be in certain aspects, more fun to cover a losing White Sox team than a winning White Sox team. Cause I don't know, you can be more free with your criticism. You can uh, wail and, and, and beat your chest and, and ask yourself why you're a fan and so on. Not that we wouldn't like to try winning ways on for say a season. It's, mm -hmm. I guess we had last year and maybe that's all we're going to have <laughs> uh, during this contention window. But anyhow, to not get too far off track, what does it feel like to be following a system that is this lousy. I mean, you could be following the Rays if you're a Rays fan, and I'm just going to throw them out there because obviously their system is very strong and their entire philosophy is very different. And we don't, they, they don't have the big superstars. They certainly don't stay around St. Peter's or very long before they're moved on to another team, but there are other teams that spend more and have better systems. And the White Sox have consistently pretty much since you've been with outside Sox had a lousy system uh, and had a dearth of of real prospects. And this is another year where we are really scrambling, particularly on the pitching side, really scam scrambling to find quality players to discuss. Do you just sort of hope like it's Chris, uh, like it's Christmas Eve and you're going to get an awesome, uh, unexpectedly awesome gift under the tree? Or is it just like, well, you know, I signed up for this. I better do it. Well, just taken from the White Sox in general, they usually, there are usually a couple guys that just come out of nowhere. They're really good at getting uh, like 
middle infield for however however much we make fun of the middle infield depth they have right now. The like the fact that Lieri Garcia he did earn himself a three year sixteen million dollar contract, even though it's not going well right now. Mm-hmm. But from where he was to where he from when they got him from Texas to where mm-hmm. he got net where he was twenty twenty one was very impressive. Same with Danny Mendick. They did a ton of great things with him. Yeah. They did it with Yolmer Sanchez. Um, and you just kind of find those guys that they keep churning out that really aren't going to make top tens, but they usually just find them and they're going to be on your team. And they, I mean, there are a couple of those guys right now. Probably the best one is Gilbert Sanchez. Um, but then you have, you know, Cole Simas, who was an undrafted free agent from 2021, who's doing awesome things right now. You've got Duke Ellis, undrafted 2020, which was just five rounds. So, like, not mm. – there's a ton of guys that were undrafted that year, right. but he's still undrafted. He was one of the guys that they just kind of find, and they just – you usually find them. It's just <laughs> – there's a huge gap between, say, Colson Montgomery, and hopefully when Norgay Vera get, gets back, he's involved in that huge gap from everybody else. And that leaves a lot of room for people to jump over other people. Um, and once those mid-season rankings come out, uh, I guess pretty soon-ish, the draft is pretty soon, a uh, month and a half, um, you're going to see a lot of new guys in those top 30s. Maybe you'll see Terrell Tatum in those top 30s, or like the aforementioned Duke Ellis in that top 30. Um, we'll see. But it is, uh, it is pretty rough, um, and they're relying on a lot of guys that we probably won't even remember in you know, next, week's pod, next week's podcast. So really with the White Sox, it's not, you're not looking to be blown, you know, going in, you're not going to be blown away. You're not, you're not, you're not shopping at the Cadillac dealership. You're really, the challenge and sort of the excitement is to, to see these guys young when they start to really show something and you didn't expect it. Uh, low picks, guys, maybe they did get from other organizations like Leori, uh, and just to see what they can do. Because clearly, I mean, obviously the White Sox system isn't so bad that nobody matricul- matriculates to the majors. And in fact, last year, the White Sox had a ton of guys. And of course, they're with the team this year. A, a ton of high draft picks who actually were playing for the team, were contributing to the team. They've had a decent, I suppose, a decent track record of at least getting those guys up into the yeah. majors, whether they're like a Zach Collins and they, you know, end up sort of flaming out or, or Gavin Sheets struggling, you know, mm-hmm. now, um, you know, it's beside the point. Making the majors is really what you want. That's the point of the farm system. So, you know, for you, it's, it's more, you know, you're not going to get that big gift under the Christmas tree, but you're just hoping you're, you're hoping to get some because you're going to open them and check them out and say, Hey, this one will surprise me. Yeah. I mean, last year, the biggest surprise was Romy Gonzalez. Sure. So you're, and, and they even, they might have their own Romy Gonzalez and Lenyon Sosa right now. So every year there's going to just be that guy, but it's definitely not top, top heavy. Um, and even their top guys are not, generally regarded as top 100 prospects in the league. They've got a long way to go. Some of that is just because they've been good for the past couple of years. Most of that is because of poor development of uh, prospect that, prospects that they've had in the system, making dumb choices like drafting college guys all the time and not really drafting high schoolers until the uh, past couple of years. So some of it's on them, or not some, most of it, 80% of it is on them for not doing their due, dil- due diligence. Um, like take Connor Pilkington, for example, he was traded away for uh, Cesar Hernandez and Pilkington's doing pretty well. Um, we'll see how long that lasts, but he went from, uh, you know, double A with the White Sox to the majors with Cleveland. Um, so they missed the mark on some guys, uh, but it's, you know, it's a, it's been a bad system. It will be a bad system uh, for this and probably next year, uh, but they, they got to use it to make the major league team better. So it might be bad for a long time. Yeah. Well, not to get off track, but I recall well, almost a year ago being panicked about losing Connor Pilkington. And you're the one who talked me down from that. So now you're talking me back up there and you're just, you're making my head snap. I do not know what to do with you, but we're going to move on from that. Cause that was a failed, unfortunately, even though it looked good at the time, uh, but all three trades looked pretty good at the time. Uh, and all three trades did not work out whatsoever. Yep. Oh, they can't do any worse this year, right? Then maybe we can look at it that way. They can't do worse this year. Of course they don't have as much to trade this year. So anyway, yeah. um, 
Darren, let's get to some MVPs. We're going to pass on uh, discussing much of Adam uh, Hazley, Hazley, whatever his uh, name is. Uh, you hope he does well enough that maybe you can help out with the team. But as you point out in the piece that is running this morning, along with this podcast, uh, you know, he's not a guy you're holding your breath on. You know, he's not a guy that you're, you're counting on much from, despite the fact he's got a decent pedigree. Let's discuss who I think was the MVP a couple of weeks ago uh, and a guy who is certainly on the short list to be called up especially with Tim Anderson injured. It seems to be time for Gilbert Sanchez. He's a guy who has just um, hit, not, not necessarily slugged, but hit extremely well, given the way he started his White Sox career. He continues to field, uh, you know, like a, like a golden God. Uh, he's a guy who seems to have a spot uh, just available on the White Sox roster because there ain't much when it comes to middle infield. Um, to follow up on your Josh Harrison DFA, what are the chances that this injury or perhaps another designation for assignment opens up a spot for Yobert? And how impatient are you getting that he's not already up? Uh, well, if Tim Anderson hadn't got injured, I'd be very impatient. Uh, but right now, they it's after Yobert Sanchez, I wouldn't be confident in anybody after that. So now it just becomes a you know a depth game. Um, and so right now for the next if Tony La Russa said Anderson was going to be out three-ish weeks, um, if, you know, Timmy's back doing awesome, Josh Harrison's still pretty bad, then I'll start clamoring, clamoring a bit more again. Because he's – what Yolbert Sanchez does right now is what uh, Josh Harrison and Leary Garcia just can't hit lefties. Um, <laughs> uh, in the That was also in the Dallas Keuchel piece, um, and – uh, I don't think they faced a lefty recently, but Josh Harrison and Leary Garcia were <laughs> both had WRC pluses below 10 yeah. against lefties, which is, you know, a typographical error. Yeah. Like that's just really terrible. Yeah. Um, but, and then Leary or uh, Yelbert Sanchez has like an 800 OPS uh, in his two levels this year so far against lefties. So at the very least he would make the lineup better against lefties like the day that he's up. Um, and he, uh, he is hitting righties better in the minors compared to Harris or compared to Leary, um, not Josh Harrison right now. Uh, but even with that, uh, what my point was is that, you know, Josh Harrison is 35. He's not getting better. Maybe he'll have a better week or a better month, but he's not going to improve. He's 35 and Josh Harrison. Gilbert Sanchez is a bit older as a prospect, but you know that he can actually improve on what he has because he has already improved since uh, midway through double a he's been a completely different player uh last year um he's a contact guy but he's actually been getting more walks recently um he'll never hit for power maybe in this kind of uh weird you know what baseball are we playing with era <laughs> um he'll have some years where he's going to have like a good <laughs> amount of doubles and triples like a yomer sanchez uh, kind of yeah kinda thing. sure um but he's definitely not going to strike out a bunch he's going to come up and just either maybe get hits or actually make contact, which is pretty hard for White Sox second baseman right now. Um, it, it'd just be a breath of fresh air all around for him to be up. Um, and the expectation is, is that he's actually good defensively, um, which that's not really the problem, but it's, you know, they can at least hold his own in one area. Is there downside to bringing him up? Again, I want to hammer at the idea that you should be, uh, as our expert, impatient that he's not up already. Is there some downside to him coming up right now? Uh, well, the only downside would be uh, when it, they would presumably DFA Josh Harrison. If another injury happens, um, then you would have to, then Romy Gonzalez probably comes up after that. And he is not as sure handed defensively in the infield, uh, compared to how he is in the outfield. Um, so that might just get tricky. Uh, uh, if you, but again, I, the advantages of him in the lineup probably outweigh that. I don't think, let me say it this way. I wouldn't be mad at all if they TFA Josh Harrison and brought up Gilbert Sanchez and then just kind of relied on Roby Gonzalez after that. Um, it would give you an opportunity to move Lenny and Sosa up to AAA and you can kind of see if he is um, still as good in AAA because really really the difference between AA and AAA is that in uh, when, he, when he would be with Charlotte, he'll just be going against guys that probably have better breaking balls. Um, so he's probably hitting fat, like decent velocity in double a where the top prospects are, but mm -hmm. now he's going up against, 
um, you know, what Tanner Banks would be in AAA. And mm -hmm. he is fine breaking stuff, not, mm -hmm. you know, not awesome, but um, you can see what he does from time to time when he goes against major league pinching. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how he would be going against. Um, but I, if they did it after this uh, road trip in Toronto, I would definitely support it. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, the, the immediate downside would just be the depth there, but it's already slim <laughs> that you can kind of just be like, throw your hands up, you know, what are you going to, what's the difference? Well, good timing with a road trip. Then I can ask you the same question next week and you can be angrier and you'll throw your hat off or something. So, so great. Now I'm committed. Yeah. We have to do one next week, Darren. Okay. Let's switch to Birmingham again. We're going to, we're going to skip one of the MVPs, the more recent one. So really this is a time travel podcast. This really was the one we recorded. We're acting like it's uh, May 31st uh, as of recording night, but no, this is actually like May 24th uh, because we're probably just going to talk about mostly MVPs from two weeks ago, but uh, as I like to call him Lenin Sosa, but uh, you're calling him Lenian or whatever. So I guess that's the proper <laughs> pronunciation, um, even though I did have Romy right. Um, uh, this is a guy who <laughs> is due to be, in, I mean, again, are you impatient that he is not in Charlotte? Obviously, the challenge of, of, of AAA, if there's even a step up challenge, which, okay, let's say there is, uh, should be mitigated by the fact that it's going to be a, a, a better environment with, in which to hit. Um, so mm -hmm. his numbers probably will not take a hit. His confidence probably should not take a hit. Uh, this is a guy you've had your eye on for a long time. He's sort of been overlooked by and large, but this year he is not allowing himself to be overlooked. Um, it's really his time. Once there's any sort of uh, a Rubik's Cube move at Charlotte, uh, he, he is definitely the guy who's coming to the Knights. Yeah, no, he should be up uh, right now. They're really... I, I guess their off day was yesterday. He, they should have just called him up yesterday, you know, just send him on his way from Alabama to North Carolina. Uh, there's really no reason he should be in double A anymore. He has a 153 WRC plus right now. And that's after a down week. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he just does everything. And now that we, before the Tim Anderson in, in, injury, we were getting kind of certain that they would choose Jake Berger over Gavin Sheets when Le Luis Robert came back. Mm -hmm. um, and now that, you know, Jake Berger and Danny Mendick are going to be um, up in the majors, there's no one actually blocking him at either second, short or third, whichever one they kind of want to play him the most at. He can play all three if he wants. Uh, but he normally, like when he comes up, he'll probably be a second baseman, um, though he's not too bad as short. But second is probably where he's going to end up even if it wasn't out of necessity, <laughs> yeah. uh, like the White Sox have, he'd still probably be a second. Um, but yeah, so that one should happen now. There's quite a few um, promotions that should happen now. That one's probably the biggest, just because he could actually help you, the major league team, later on if he keeps proving it. Like he's at double A. There's not, there, I mean, there is a huge gap between double A and MLB, but the gap between, you know, getting promoted from double A to MLB in this day and age is not huge. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they don't, again, it's Josh Harrison. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not like, you know, the, there's a ton of guys in front. Um, so they should give him that opportunity sooner than later. Yeah. And speaking to the chaos, it's really is going in Charlotte. Let's face it. Triple A is now just this weird sort of like, but like four a bus station type of thing where it's just like, you know, they're legit guys and they're guys of rehab. You got Aloy there, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jonathan Lee, who's, who's working with us now and doing a lot of great tweets on our behalf uh, now. And is certainly a huge uh, veteran presence at Charlotte Knights games in addition to uh, uh, Winston and, and Kannapolis as well. Um, you know, just before the game, he was asking uh, Julio Mascara, you know, the acting manager um, of the Knights, you know, like what what the what the week's pitching uh, rotation was. And he was like, he had a couple names like right off the bat, but otherwise he's like, well, he had bullpen, well, uh, bullpen, <laughs> and, you know, that that can extend really to the lineup as well, because it is it's in such a weird state uh, of flux with Berger up, uh, Mendick up. Um, you know, there does seem to be ample opportunity. See, we're going to get you heated, Darren. We, by, <laughs> certainly by next week, we're going to get you heated about the fact if these guys haven't moved yet, uh, be smart. Rick Hunt, you're listening. Hello, Rick. <laughs> That's yeah. Darren. He's the guy. Um, you know, come on. Uh, it's time for it's time for Sosa to, to move up to Charlotte. Let's take, uh, take a quick break before we go back to the Carolinas and talk about the uh, single A ballplayers, MVPs, some of whom we'll ignore, some of whom we'll discuss in detail. Uh, hang with us here on the farm podcast number 28. We will be back in just a minute. 
Hey, White Sox fans, Brett Valentini, not sure why I am here talking about the farm system. I guess I'm an expert. I'm an expert by default. I back <laughs> myself into being an expert. Hey, listen, man, I pegged Terrell Tatum before the season. Not that that's the biggest deal, but he was my guy this year. Popeye was my guy last year. Doesn't look so good this year, but okay, we'll just go skip past that. Uh, I'm here with Darren Black, who is the Rick Khan Whisperer. <laughs> uh, send all thank you notes and you can you can send them to Southside Sox and care of me I will make sure to pass on the boxes and uh, postal reams uh, up to the Chicagoland area so that Darren reads every one of your letters of praise for getting Dallas Keuchel DFA'd off of the Chicago White Sox let's see what his next how he will spin his next magic just get him a little angry he'll write a killer piece of analysis that Rick Hamill will read and then action happens in fact maybe send letters to me and care of Southside Sox with future suggestions players you're angry at need to go Darren will do the research and if it just doesn't look good to him and the guy's got like say a, a 10 WRC plus hey maybe he will write a piece that says get rid of this guy that's the kind mm -hmm. of power that Darren Black my co-host on <laughs> oh, Farm yeah. Podcast has that man is ready to flex. All right, let is, let's flex to Winston-Salem, the Winston-Salem Dash. You know, all of these teams are awful. Let's not forget it. We don't even have a one team like last year's Birmingham Barons where you can say, wow, they're doing well. They're at the top of their division. Not that playoffs matter, not that doing well matters particularly, but boy, it sure is nice to actually win instead of losing. It has been, I can't imagine how, I don't want to even try to track your record, Darren Black. All these years, all the losses that oh, you've yeah. covered. Yeah in your many uh, uh, nightly minor league updates. Uh, and these last couple of years has been, I think, rougher, <laughs> rougher than most. And this season is um, a return to an unfortunate form where the teams are badly below 500. Winston-Salem, uh, another one of those. Uh, Terrell Tatum and Jordan uh, Mikhail, the um, uh, undrafted uh, free agent, uh, not drafted Jordan. I believe he is this week's uh, MVP. Have himself a good outing, though we're not really sure if he's um, starter material or relief material. And then Tatum, a guy who's got uh, super wheels, has a little pop. He had some extremely dramatic College World Series uh, homer, although I don't think we're looking to that from him. And I know that uh, two weeks ago, you had some flags that said, hey, listen, don't go crazy, Brett, and all the other people who really like Tatum, uh, <laughs> because there's some very strange trends here that he's going to have to really sort of fight through. But uh, let's talk about uh, either one of these guys, because they actually seem like these two could continue having success as they move up the system, if not make it to the majors, uh, certainly be worthy of our uh, attention for uh, for future seasons. Yeah, I, I would say Terrell Tatum is definitely one to keep an eye on more than um, Jordan Michael, um, just because uh, uh, Tatum has actually shown like the best that he can be, which mm -hmm. is currently like just right now. Um, and Mikel is kind of a tweener. He's kind of um, uh, Kyle Kubat. Uh, if yeah. he's been kind of everything and everywhere, uh, a soft tossing guy. You're not really sure if he is ever going to get to the majors. Maybe he'll get a Tanner Bank surprise, um, but I would not, you know, make that likely. Um, but with, with with Tatum, um, I guess they they did come out at the same time, and Tatum was actually drafted as opposed to right. um, Mikel, which I mean, at that point, it's not a ton of money, but the fact that the White Sox wanted to lock one of them down um, is at least notable. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, so the concerning trends with Tatum basically are just the strikeout rate is at um, 30%, which it was down the last time we talked about him uh, compared to last week already, uh, mm -hmm. which is good. But still 30% in high A is not something that I would be <laughs> comfortable with. Um, you expect it to just go incrementally up at worst, yeah. at worst, um, as you go from double A AA to triple A, just because you're facing better pitching. Um, but so that's not fantastic. Uh, he did hit a couple homers last week, so he is showing that more that pop again. Um, he hadn't just he hadn't hit homer uh, in low A and only came out with one last year. Um, so it's good to see that he's actually hitting more pop right now. Um, and besides the homers, he does he does have six extra base hits in just uh, 18 games, non homer uh, extra base hits. So pretty good so far. Um, the biggest concern is that he's a near 60% ground ball rate. So the fact that he is hitting um, like that much, you know, power gap power right now is kind of, you wonder if that's just kind of him just going being streaky, which he definitely has proven to be a kind of a streaky mm -hmm. player right now. Um, but he's, I mean, 
a 60% ground ball rate and a 30% <laughs> K rate is not a great profile to build on. Um, he doesn't have a lot of pro games under his belt yet. Right. Like he just has 28 this year, just 26 last year. So there's still a lot of unknown, um, but he, there's just a lot of, you know, there's a reason why he's not a top 30 prospect in the White Sox system in a bad White Sox system mm -hmm. when his, uh, you know, uh, end of year stats look pretty, or his current stats right now looks pretty fantastic. And he really hasn't moved up over anybody. Mm -hmm. It's because he's hitting a ton of ground balls, striking out too much um, and doesn't have, you know, reliable power yet. Um, but he, well, it's just kind of a wait and see with him. He could be, you know, he could be Romy Gonzalez who comes out of nowhere, or he could just be, you know, a guy that you don't remember. Which well, Terrell, is a lot. Terrell, uh, uh, Darren Black is challenging you, but I believe in you. I have faith. Uh, you got pedigree. Uh, keep it up. Uh, I'm glad, listen, <laughs> you know, we need guys to, we, we need players to open eyes. Um, and because even some of the guys uh, <laughs> that we go into saying, all right, well, he's our top prospect. Or he's a top five, top 10 prospect. Uh, there's so many <laughs> disappointed. We don't have to talk about them. This podcast this is going to be a happy, happy podcast, uh, that, you know, any, you know, any flashes are enough to say, oh, okay. Now, speaking of flashes, uh, at the lowest level playing right now, the Canapolis cannonballers, um, terrible team, but, um, some, some guys of note, uh, Colson Montgomery has really, um, he stood up and be the guy and been the guy that we all uh, hoped he is and, and justifying, if not top prospect status, darn, uh, darn near there. Um, and uh, <laughs> on the opposite end of the spectrum, a guy with incredible uh, pedigree and that his father pitched for the Chicago White Sox, but Cole Seamus is a guy who just uh, relieved, I think probably to, I guess, to preserve the arm relieved last year. And I, you know, I went in thinking, well, okay, this is a relief pitcher who, um, uh, you know, did pretty well in his little short audition, uh, after turning pro. And, you know, now he is starting and he is really arguably he's been the best starter in the system. Not that there's been fierce competition, especially with Vera out. Uh, but he's a guy who's actually pitched really well along with Christian Mena. Um, Talk about either one of these guys. Obviously, one coming up with tons of hype to have to live up to, and another guy who's just sort of been, you know, even though again, it's got the pedigree, it's not like uh, people maybe don't expect seeing the name Seamus and think, all right, well, this guy should be going somewhere. Well, he's undrafted, did really sort of come out of nowhere, and he, going back to last year, has not disappointed maybe but for an outing. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm well, quite frankly, I'm going to concentrate on Seamus right now just mm -hmm. because of where he's come from. Mm -hmm. So he, um, first off, he was a reliever all in college. He only started a few games. So it's not like he uh, just did the, you know, normal uh, draft pick thing, right. you know, starter. There's just so many people on the Arizona complex league and just here, here right. you're inning. Right. Type of thing. No, he, he was a reliever in college, <laughs> really <laughs> terrible command. And <laughs> that's kind of flipped. I mean, it kind of flipped right away in uh, last year. The command was much better in 2021. Um, and as uh, um, in the in the weekly update from a little blurb from Fangraphs, the his uh, summer uh, college summer ball league in 2021 uh, was or 2020 really kind of flipped a switch for him. Uh, the the uh, velocity went up a bit um, and it's gone up a couple of ticks this year as well. So now he's kind of in that Davis Mar Martin range of 93, 95. Um, though I think Martin can actually hit 97, 98, not regularly at all, mm -hmm. but I don't think CMS can get to that point yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's got a 35% uh, K rate in low <laughs> A right now and just an 8% walk rate. So both fantastic numbers. Mm -hmm. Um so besides uh, Sosa, it's CMS is the next guy that I, I just, he needs to be in Winston-Salem. Mm -hmm. um, beyond the fact that they just don't have a ton of guys, uh, he is 22. So he's not, you know, yeah. some uh, young pitcher like a Jared Kelly, Matthew Thompson, Andrew Dahlquist that you just kind of want to keep at whatever level he's at to find, to find out what he is. Um, you just want to kind of push him to see out what he maybe can't do find out at what level that he just kind of starts to falter. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's different from Kelly and Dawquist and Thompson because they have continually, continuously faltered and not had this kind of stretch um, in their careers. But yeah, I mean, he is really doing it all. And you can't even say that it's kind of like a Babbitt problem. It's pretty near average. His FIP mm -hmm. is three, four. So it is almost a run higher, but um, for what he's doing, it's just, I mean, 
he, I mean, he was an, he's an undrafted free agent and now he's going to be a top 30 prospect on every single list. Mm -hmm. It is, you are right that it's slim pickings, especially for White Sox pitching and especially White Sox starting pitching. Um, but he has set himself uh, at a bar that um, needs to be paid attention to. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope he gets his turn uh, soon. Um, I think he started on Sunday, actually. Uh, so maybe they'll keep him there for another start or two, see what he does. Um, I hope they don't wait till the draft because that is a month from now. Um, but I would love to see him actually make it up to Winston-Salem and basically let him prove, um, you know, at what point that he's not this fantastic uh, mm -hmm. unknown pitcher that the White Sox found. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic unknown pitcher. So how do you delineate where he's a guy who's going to be on the top 30 list? Uh, it seems like he's played. And again, on the White Sox, that isn't exactly a compliment, but okay. You know, he, <laughs> so he gets on the radar. Um, d is clear is just clearing the bar onto a top 30 list enough for you to say, okay, this guy's a legit prospect. Does he have to be, do does he have to at least oh, be doing yeah. this at the dash level to say, okay, there's something real here? No, what he's doing. Well, I don't want to say it's something real, but <laughs> what he's doing right now is something that no other pitcher on Kannapolis is doing right now. Mm -hmm. And again, he's 22. Th that is older for low A, mm -hmm. but he's not, uh, you know, Tanner Banks at 28, you know, right. throwing a two ERA in Birmingham. Right. Um, that's not the same scenario at all. He mm -hmm. still is kind of around the same age. Um, his breaking pitches seem legit. They're not, you know, they're not fantastic, which would probably sell, sail him through the system mm -hmm. faster. Um, but they're at least above average, um, which at low A, you're going to get a lot of strikeouts on, on you know, like Benjamin Bailey's of the world with yeah. pretty good breaking pitches. Um, and so if you send him to the dash and he's still, you know, relying on 93, 95 with a good slider, good curve, um, and he's sailing through the, uh, those uh, opposing batters in high A2, then honestly, give him a shot in August at double A. Mm -hmm. uh, the, again, the system for the White Sox starting pitching is not deep. <laughs> and you need yeah. guys closer to being able to be called up. Um, yeah. now, again, his situation is slightly different because he needs to be stretched out as well. Yeah. Um, so I would not be surprised if he stayed in Kannapolis for a while even though I don't think that's the correct decision. Mm -hmm. I think you should send them up to Winston-Salem and see what he can do. Um, but at the end of the year, he probably will, I think he's going five, six innings to start, or like five, five and a third. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's going six innings right now in uh, minor league baseball. Um, but you might see him go three or four and still, look, and still maybe allow a run mm -hmm. or maybe none um, mm -hmm. by the end of the year. But mm -hmm. out of anybody that does, any pitcher in the entire system, um, <laughs> Cole Seamus deserves the promotion. <laughs> so yes, uh, uh, both just in general and specific to the White Sox system, which has plenty of holes, plenty of opening, man, he can make it to Charlotte by the end of this year. Uh, he is definitely a legitimate prospect. And it's almost when you're in a system like this, it's almost like not that you want to be too aggressive, but you know, you, you have an opportunity at least to sort of, you know, play the challenge round of like, okay, well put him up there, like put him up there to see if he belongs versus, you know, making a guy stay like an extra half season or season, because it's just, the system is so very clogged. There's really no aspect of the White Sox system, probably even at first base where they have 8,000 oh, yeah. first basemen uh, in the major league level where it's so clogged that there isn't room for guys, as you pointed out very well with uh, Sosa and others. Uh, you know, where there isn't, there isn't room because there just isn't, there's, you know, you read the minor league updates and God bless you, Darren, for, for doing them and doing them so dutifully, but you read them and you're just like, okay, well, it's great that Alex Destino had a, a pretty nice uh, day or, or, or Tyler <laughs> yeah. Osick, but it's like, well, okay. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it's sort of like following the team in the, in the, in the, in the later teens where it's like, okay, it's, you know, it's rebuilding time. So it's really cool that Yolmer Sanchez had a, you know, had a really great game where he's really had a really high, he was player of the week, but it's like, well, okay, it's, it's still an asterisk. Like, all right, well, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. Who cares about it? No offense to Yomer, but who cares? So yeah, that's what the whole system is right now. So it's nice that there are a few bright spots and I appreciate that you high, you highlighting every week and even on a monthly basis, that's coming. Um, you know, the, the guys who are standing out because some of them actually have traction as legit uh, prospects, uh, maybe not even all 30 uh, would be considered. <laughs> 
Uh, but you know, at least there are enough guys, enough names on that list uh, that aren't, let's say if we're going to talk about like the top 40 charts, they're not all like, you know, some of them actually are with a bullet. You know, most of these guys, like, you know, the Matthew Thompson's of the world are all like, sort of like sinking. Last week, they were fifth. Now they're 15th. They're just sort of like mm -hmm. dragging down this list. And the fact they're even still on the list is because there's nothing else. I mean, Jerry Kelly can be on the list 10 years from now just because there's nobody else <sighs> to replace him. But uh, anyway, that starts to get depressing. This was a happy podcast. Uh, we are going to do this in another week. I promise all you listeners. I know that you don't believe me. You know that I'm a liar. I'm a very <laughs> deceptive host of the Farm Podcast. We've had, not had nearly as many as we got out of the gate with uh, a year ago when we started this, uh, but we're going to get back on track. And even though <laughs> we struggle sometimes to figure out what to talk about, Darren manages to highlight a, a guy. And sometimes it's even fun to talk about the guys. It's like, well, he's not a prospect, but man, did he have a week. You know, we can, we can talk like next week about Craig Dedalo. You know, I mean, okay. You know, yeah. you'll have another like five homers and, you know, he's a big guy. And, and Joe Reese always likes to point out that he's from Indiana <laughs> University. So, you know, there's always <laughs> stuff to talk about. And plus, you know, we only have a half hour. We can fill that. Imagine if we were doing the race system. We'd have to do four podcasts like Too every much. week, just dealing with each level. And that's just, that's just more work than SB nation is paying, paying us for. So yeah. we can't do that. So Thank maybe you white Sox for having exactly. bad farm system. <laughs> system. All four levels this year, not just three, all four. Uh, yeah. Well, we'll see what uh, Dominican and Arizona have for us this year. Maybe there'll be a, a shock and a surprise. Probably not. Oh, yeah. Uh, Darren. Well, <laughs> Thanks for the insight. As always, thank you for uh, wielding the hammer on Dallas Keuchel. I cannot wait to find out what inspires you to next write major league analysis and then who is on the chopping block. Uh, it's going to be fun to find out. Obviously, right for now, it's Josh Harrison, but who knows? It could change. The way the White Sox are playing, there's a race to the bottom. and Maybe somebody is actually more uh, in legitimate position for DFA than even Josh Harrison. But we'll see. Uh, when you get angry, tell me first. So at least I have a heads up. And uh, we can, um, you know, we can let... And we can let Rick know. Hey, Rick. Yeah. This is your next move. So uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, including you, Rick Hahn, and uh, White Sox front office, Ken Williams. You're my guy. Good to talk to you, as always. Um, Darren, thanks for doing this. Um, hey, you know what? <laughs> You'll hear the knock on the door in a week, and it might be pizza delivery. It might be me, or it could be both. You could have, like, a pizza, pizza party podcast. You're already juggling coverage of four oh, yeah. dynamic White Sox farm teams tonight. As you're talking, mm. you're probably missing very key details. <laughs> so I guess I should let you go, let you bounce. <laughs> you can catch up on all those details. Look forward to reading that uh, uh, this morning, along with uh, this podcast and the weekly piece. And we've got your monthly piece coming. It's a big week for Darren Black. He, he's, oh, yeah. he's, it's a victory lap after getting Dallas Keuchel DFA'd and it's his, his, his reward is to do a whole lot more minor league updating. Well, congratulations, Darren. It's a prize. I'll be happy to give you through September. Oh yeah. And <laughs> next time we talk, the Arizona complex league the, might've started. Oh, Even though the draft is in July. What a great, great setup. There's just a yeah. bunch of guys hanging around. We'll find out where Bryce Bush really is. We'll find out if uh, if Vera is, if he has yeah, both arms Vera? intact and, and uh, et cetera. So uh, yeah, we'll look forward to that. Maybe we'll loop it in ASAP because Lord knows we need <laughs> something else to talk about. Uh, oh, Darren, yeah, thanks yeah. for doing this. And uh, thanks everybody for uh, listening, reading, watching. Without you, we don't do this. And you know, really actually, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't because maybe we could take more breaks, but the promise is <laughs> next week we'll catch you then for number 29 and we'll have a lot of interesting stuff to talk about including maybe yolbert's major league debut or sosa uh, hitting three homers at uh, charlotte or whatever it is or not but we'll be talking to you in a week thanks everybody <laughs>